All right. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Finance Committee. Are there any public, public comments on the agenda for this evening? Seeing none. Oh, sorry. Move on to the 2022-2023 budget update. Mr. Zablowski. Okay. All right. So we're looking at the, the month just ended, uh, January. So we're seven months into our fiscal year. Uh, our local revenues are lagging behind last year, but last year was an exceptional year with transfer taxes, a lot of delinquent taxes collected. Uh, we did just get some uh, really good news this week. Um, the transfer taxes, a big property owned by Johnson & Johnson, transferred hands, and we got, uh, what was it, $700,000? 774000 transfer tax that it received today for Thanks. the month of January. So we, we should be catching up. As you can see, we're about uh, two, uh, two percentage points behind where we were last year. Uh, states uh, above uh, where we thought we were going to be, but we passed our budget before the state did, and Governor Wolf was kind to a lot of uh, the public schools, uh, and we are expecting to get more than we actually budgeted. Uh, federal revenue is starting to slow down. We have until September of 24 to spend the ESSERS money. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to last that long. Um, and, and we're, we're not spending on anything that's going to have a continual impact on our budget. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, so you can see that our, uh, the percentage of 82.71 compared to last, uh, last year at 82.61, that's impacted because of the reduced amount of fund balance that we, uh, had planned to use this year. Uh, on the expenditure side, uh, going just as we had, had thought, uh, with the uh, benefits and wages uh, a little bit less than they were last year. Again, there are some vacancies that we're still trying to fill, um, and, uh, and, and our su sub costs uh, are uh, increasing because we need to you know, put uh, personnel in the classrooms. Uh, our property services are up. That's uh, a lot of the uh, contracted work that uh, Mr. Lally talks about. The, the uh, amount that we have to pay is definitely being uh, impacted by the inflation. Uh, factor, uh, so that's a little bit above where we had expected to be at this time. Uh, the purchased uh, other purchased services were at 36% uh, compared to 40%, but just to let you know, we are a couple months behind in the first student bills. I think we just approved the October bill today, so we have quite a few bills to, to get caught up with. Uh, supplies, uh, and it is 61% compared to about 56% last year. A lot of that has to do with our utilities, where you know, I'm sure you're seeing some additional cost in your utility bills. Same thing's happening here at the school district. Uh, equipment, not a, not a big dollar amount, but still you know, about 20% more than what we had spent at this time last year. So as far as the, you know, the comparison, it looks like we're 38% this year compared to 37% last year. So we do believe that the, the budget is progressing much like we had thought it would. And uh, uh, with about five months to go, we'll see how that, uh, how that shakes out at the end. Any questions on the budget comparison? Nope. Okay, then uh, next on the agenda is uh, fund balance. We're gonna let Mark talk about that. Thank you, Dave. Um, as a part of the overall budget process, we always want to look at our general fund, our fund balance, as well as our capital reserve. Um, so making your way down, the general fund is made up of many different, I like to call them buckets. We can put dollars into each bucket, assign that for a specific purpose. The non-spendable item is called, a, it's a prepaid item. Basically, it's a timing issue. If we pay a bill before the end of the year, uh, and it's not applicable until the following fiscal year, we don't want to record that as an expense for the, in the budget, um, which would you know, throw off the budget to actual. So again, prepaid items, mostly that's going to be your uh, health insurance. We like to, or we're required to pay the health insurance before the end of the month for the following month. Um, so that's why, as of now, it's a zero because everything has already been flipped into the current year. Uh, restricted bucket represents the athletics cash account. Uh, we maintain two different cash accounts for the with White Marsh High School Athletics Fund, as well as the CMS, uh, CMS Athletic Fund. Again, those are restricted dollars. They don't roll into the general fund. They're to be used and administered by those two athletic funds. Uh, the next bucket is considered, or what we look like to call the committed bucket. Um, you'll see that there are five different buckets within the committed. We have our employer retirement rate stabilization. 
Uh, we have a healthcare rate stabilization, the OPEB, otherwise known as other post-employment benefits. We have tax assessment appeals, and most recently uh, added three years ago was our COVID-19 contingency. Um, each one of those buckets represents a, a, a reserve that we have for future costs, future escalations, catastrophic events, especially with the healthcare. Um, like I just mentioned, the COVID-19 was the most recent one. Um, that was a result of a surplus going back to the 2020-2021 year because we had so much in federal money given to us um, that we attributed to our supplies uh, to make those purchases. The next uh, bucket is the assigned uh, non-recurring expenditures, expenditures. This number actually ties back to Mr. Zablowski's budget uh, preparation that he'll roll forward and then his next, uh, next agenda item, the million dollars is what we could potentially use to help balance the budget. Again, it's a number that's just sitting there to offset future expenses uh, related, to, um, related to the future budget. The last bucket is the unassigned. Um, this is what uh, a lot of school districts have to maintain less than 8% of their expenditures in. Again, this is, think of it as the cumulative effect of every fiscal year as that ends. So if we have surpluses in year, it'll roll into the unassigned balance. If we have the deficits in our fund balance, the cumulative effect that is captured in the unassigned balance. Now, this all wraps up into what's obviously known as the general fund balance. And you can see that over the years from 2017 to currently right now, we, we, we kind of hover around the 26, or I'm sorry, in the mid 20 millions to uh, a little bit north of 30 million right now. Or I'm sorry, 28.5 million. Um, as a part of our AAA rating, uh, finance agencies want to see you know, $20 million as a general average number in the general fund of balances. So we've been able to maintain that through, you know, the budget process over the last six, seven years. Um, and that's where we stand right now. If you look down a little bit further, you'll see the capital reserve balance. Um, that's predominantly used for exactly what it sounds like, large capital infrastructure events. This is what we look at when Mr. Lally wants to talk about his projects going forward. These are the dollars that we need to maintain on an annual basis to fund the roofing projects or if we have to fund an addition or a renovation here at CES. So I kind of wanted to just give, or not I kind of, sorry, I wanted to give the board an idea as to where we stand throughout each of our different buckets, um, see if there's any questions. And then this will be something that is obviously, um, it, it's, a, it's, a ever, it's a live document, you know, something that can change. It'll change every year as far as, far as the unassigned balance goes with surpluses or deficits, um, as well as funding other uh, capital projects that might come up in connection with the five-year study. Um, so again, I just wanted to get this in front of everybody if anybody had any questions. Uh, but this, again, will be a part of a, a presentation that we have every year. We'll discuss every year as a board and administration and then just yeah, use it as, a, as we have to. Sure. I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> capital Reserve Fund has gone up significantly the last two years. Most of that is from what we just voted on at the last meeting, from transferring the excess money from the projects back into Capital Reserve. Yeah, we took, if you look at the assigned balance, you'll see it was $3.25 million and is now a million. That was a part of the board action to move two point two five out at the last finance committee meeting and subsequently the last board, as well as $4 million, uh, I'm sorry, $4.5 million out of the unassigned balance and into the capital reserve yet. Yeah. That capital reserve is built up by the surpluses of the unassigned balance. Thanks. And then COVID-19, how long is it gonna be reasonable to keep that contingency as a reserved fund? That's something that we'll have to talk about. Um, I think you know, the idea Probably was May. to get out of this year and yeah. Yeah, get through this winter, and then um, we can continue to talk about that going forward. Gotcha. And then um, just from looking historically, the restricted athletics fund, is there a reason that that was higher before and now it's lower? Like it was 36,000 in 2017, now we're down to 13. And most likely it was a timing issue. Okay. What happens with athletics is that the general fund, the district funds, um, we will pay their officials and then they owe us the money. Um, what probably happened in those years is that they paid us after June 30th. Gotcha. So they had the money in their account, they cut the check probably July that first week in July, and then the, you know, the funds uh, decreased, obviously. Okay. And then fund balance overall, I know there's been a lot in the news from Auditor General. Mm -hmm. um, 
Are we, is there anything we can put out to assure the public that we're not the bad examples that they're doing? Like, I know we opted out of the Act 1 index. We're not asking for exceptions. Right. Um, you know, last year we had a minimal rate increase that we lowered the, uh, we're using some of the fund balance to pay to keep our taxes low. Is there any other examples or any documentation that the public can find to show that uh, we're being responsible with our fund balance? So uh, this is basically going to be tied into our capital reserve five-year improvement plan that we need to, you know, review on an annual basis. It allows us to, you know, justify or review these dollars in all these different buckets to say, here's why we have these dollars at these levels, because we are tying it into our capital improvement project plan. It's not that we're just moving money in between buckets. It's we're developing future projects. We're de developing investment in the district with these dollars and it's those two documents are always going to be tied to each other fund balance and cap five-year capital great thank you mm -hmm. yep so if that's it i'm going to give it back to mr sabrowski sorry did anyone else have questions i didn't mean to monopolize yeah, all the questions okay. yeah i mean that, that's the reason we picked this meeting because we know joe's going to be presenting how he's going to spend the money we're presenting where we're going to get that money to pay for what joe's going to spend it on so obviously looking at a $6.9 million uh, expenditure you know, in the summer of 24 and another you know, $3 million, $13 million is a nice balance to have, but it's not going to last very long uh, if we have to expand like we talked about in the previous meeting. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay, the next agenda item is an update on the 23-24 budget. We briefly touched on this in January. Uh, we had not had a chance to uh, calculate the personnel. Uh, so we do have some uh, some good news. Uh, we always start with our 22 taxes and where Colonial Falls as compared to the rest of the school districts in Montgomery County. And you can see we're third from the bottom with a millage rate of 24.395. And we have been very responsible with, uh, with our tax increases over the last few years uh, in, in the opposition to the Auditor General's report where he picked 12 school districts that actually went at the Act 1 or in index or above and still had a significant amount of fund balance. So um, I think that's that you know goes to show our responsibility to our taxpayers. Uh, this year the Act 1 index, uh, which is uh, announced in uh, September, is 4.1%. Uh, uh, because our aid ratio is 0.15, we do not get an adjustment, so we uh, multiply it by the one and come up with 4.1. At 24.395, a 4.1% increase in taxes would be a full mill. Uh, so that would take us to uh, you know, the 24.395. Uh, uh, and a value of our mill is 4.2, a uh, little bit over $4.2 million right now. So that would bring in $4.2 million if we decided that we could raise taxes to the one mil. Now we've already opted out of the fact that we can't go over the 4.1. So our goal is to keep it under the 4.1. So just a summary of impact items. Uh, we talked about the enrollment study, which is going to start. Uh, well, it's already started. We're looking at uh, getting a presentation to the board in the, in the May time frame. Uh, so, so we'll see where we're actually looking for enrollment in the future. Uh, obviously, an increasing enrollment means we have, have to increase our teaching staff to keep the student-teacher ratio down. Uh, we do incorporate uh, retirements uh, at this early date. Uh, you'll see that uh, later on in this presentation we have uh, four retirements already, which is a, a it's always sad to see, you know, senior teachers go and all that experience, but from a budgetary standpoint, it saves us money, so we look, we look forward to that to, to help keep that millage down. Uh, wages and salaries are obviously uh, affected by the collective bargaining agreements we have with our unions. Uh, most of the unions, uh, we have a 3% cap on. Uh, employee benefits are, have been a big cost for every school district for the last uh, Couple decades, especially with the uh, with the PEASERS retirement benefit, uh, we are looking at a pension benefit, and also the health care costs are added uh, increase uh, that we have to account for. Uh, we have special education costs. We never know what uh, what the exceptionalities our our children may be coming with that we might have to address. Uh, we have our VOTEC tuition, which is a bigger issue this year. We'll get to that later because the VOTEC budget is on the agenda. Uh, charter schools have been a, a, uh, a rising cost over the last few years, especially with COVID. And as Mark referenced, the use of fund balance is always something that we uh, look at to try to you know, 
limit the increase of taxes on our, our taxpayer. But looking at the revenue, we have the, the detailed revenue is attached to board docs. So you can see exactly the history of uh, revenue over the last four years, the budget, and what we're projecting for next year. You can see that uh, this does not assume any tax increase. So just with that, we are looking at a almost a $3.5 million uh, increase in revenue, um, basically on the strength of our assessments uh, and, and the property values within the, the Colonial School District. So that's a good thing, looking at it here in February. Uh, that's uh, something a lot of schools don't have that luxury of seeing the assessments go up like we've seen. So getting into some of the uh, nitty gritty of wages and benefits, we have personnel costs, which is our wages and benefits. That takes up 72, almost 73% of our budget. So it's a very, these are very important items. Uh, we do have additional personnel included in this budget. Uh, we'll monitor that. We wanted to show you a worst case scenario. So there are five new FTEs in there. Uh, and then to, to offset that, we have four projected retirements or terminations for 23 24. Uh, we are still looking at our uh, consortium, the Bucksmont Consortium. They gave us a first look. We normally get a second and third. The second should be coming in this month. Uh, but the first look they gave us was a 9% increase. So that's. Uh, significantly more we we had about a four percent reduction last year so the nine percent you know is going to get us right back to where we were probably two years ago now, just to jump in on the uh, additional personnel versus projected requirements that's not one net new person that's nine new people for uh, so it's five new positions four people retiring and they're being replaced with four younger people plus five net new ones correct. so it'd be done okay. nine new faces correct thank you uh, now, the PISA's uh, liability, uh, we have to contribute based on the, the state plan, which is a mandated plan. Uh, we were looking at consistent increases around 2, you know, you know one, to, 1 to 3 percent the past few years. So it has been leveling off, not like it was 10 years ago when it was going up by, you know, 10, 20 percent. Uh, but this year, we were shocked when the uh, certification came in in December at 34 percent down from 35.26%. So that is going to be a savings for us, and you'll see that as we get into some of the detail. Just going forward on that, <clears throat> PISERS is based on the number of people in the system. It's, the number didn't go down because of the money they were managing had a high return. It was they, they're paying out slightly less, so they need slightly less in. Is that? That's correct. Plus, plus they have changed the system for anybody hired after July 1st of 2019. So they're not mm -hmm. under the same plan that, uh, that, that you know, the administrators or the employers that we had prior to 2019. They're in more of a, a defined contribution plan. So it could be from some of the savings from that plan also. But it's going to take 30-some years until everybody in the old plan is off that plan and all everybody's on the defined contribution plan. Yeah. So hopefully that number should stay level and not do what our ben do the benefits did and shoot right back up and correct. Take correct. Uh, I mean yeah. we we've, we've looked at the projections and it does say stay flat not like the you know the ski slope we saw back in the in the in the early teens. Great. Thank you. So that's a 3.5% decrease. So the uh, if we look at the expense impact items, uh, these are everything beyond the benefits and wages. Uh, you can see the professional services. Uh, this year has gone up six uh, six point four million versus six million. I think that's a correction from you know, the other previous year when we started to see professional uh, services come down. But then we've been hit with these la large uh, you know, legal fees, uh, sub costs uh, because uh, we have a lot of subs that we deal with on a, on a daily basis. Uh, you're going to see the purchase services is a, is a large impact item this year, uh, 17.219 compared to 16. So that's a one, almost a $1.2 million increase. And like I said, uh, the tuition we're paying to the Votech is making up uh, a lot of that increase. Uh, supplies are going down. Uh, we, we still have a lot to look at as far as the, you know, make sure the uh, the fuel bids come in, uh, the electricity, we're dealing with Provident Energy, who handles most of our energy consumption. So uh, we're waiting uh, to talk to them about where we can expect all the uh, prices to end up for next year. Uh, equipment is up. Uh, we did find out that uh, we got some clarification. Uh, was it was late last month about vehicles. Vehicles can, uh, and lesser buses. Buses can be purchased from, from capital projects. 
but vehicles like trucks, gators, things like that, have they cannot be purchased by capital projects. So we moved some of the, the Joe's replacement vehicles over into the general fund where they normally would have been in capital projects. And our debt services remain co uh, pretty constant, so the interest in fees and the debt service and transfers are relatively stable from year to year. So our projected budget, and we get into the detail of the, the summary that I have attached to the board docs, we're looking at revenue of 147, almost 148 million, but our expenditures as of this point are coming in at 151 million, leaving us about a $3.3 million deficit. Uh, we're going the wrong direction. Uh, from what I presented in, in January. The wages and benefits are actually came down a little bit, but we did get the, uh, the, uh, the budget from the vote tech, which is having an impact. But if we decided that we had to fund that completely with a tax increase, not that we're saying we're going to do that, but it would be a 0.79 mil increase or 3.25%. Now that's without considering fund balance and it's still early. Uh, Governor Shapiro gets till March 7th to announce his, his budget. So hopefully he'll continue the trend that Governor Wolf of giving school districts more money. So the next steps is we, we will await the, the governor uh, March 7th uh, and we have a Commonwealth budget seminar set up for a week after that. So Pasbo puts on a great, uh, you know, they get into the numbers and they're giving themselves about a week to, to make a presentation. So we'll know a little bit better within, by the middle of March, how much uh, we can expect from the, from the government. Uh, we are, we'll, it's an ongoing thing. We're going to continue to, to look at all the budget requests. Uh, we do tell the buildings they have until, you know, March and April to, you know, uh, come to, you know, really give us more correct information than they could have back in September and October when we got the originals. And uh, we're going to monitor the student enrollment. The K registration uh, is, is starting now. So we'll see exactly how many, how many kids are coming out this year. So the timeline is uh, we'll meet again to talk about the budget on March 6th. Uh, governor the next day will uh, introduce his state budget. Then we have uh, April 3rd is a finance committee. That'll probably be the last time we'll talk about it before the final proposed, which is currently scheduled for April 20th. And then we'll have uh, uh, April 1st and, and possibly the June meeting uh, to talk about the, the final budget adoption. So, any questions on where we're at currently? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. All right, the, the next item uh, has to do with the uh, PW and the middle school spring musicals. We have their budgets available, so I'll let Mark uh, take over from here. So thank you, Dave, for zooming in on that. I know there's uh, some fine print there, but this is just an opportunity for us to advertise for both the PW spring musical and the CMS spring musical. Uh, the CMS spring musical this year is going to be Mary Poppins Jr on March 2nd to the 5th. Um, it's put on by Amy Venkis over at the middle school. And this is the budget document that was submitted to the business office and then subsequently vetted by us just to make sure that you know they're being fiscally responsible with their student activity dollars, their budget appropriately. Um, and then uh, ultimately we'll do a subsequent report for actual activity. It'll be after the production. But again, this we wanted to get this um, presented to the Finance Committee for a review, questions. Uh, subsequent approval, and then again, like I said, advertising the CMS musical. Um, again, that's put on by Amy Venkis down at CMS. Dave, if you want to go to the EW. And sorry, is CMS doing two musicals, the seventh, eighth, and the sixth this year for the first yeah. time? Okay. Yeah, they're doing the first one's the seventh, seventh and eighth grade. And then Amy, it's amazing that Amy, uh, she never wants to <laughs> put in the extra effort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she said she's doing two, two shows this year. She just, she had so many kids interested. She said, will you support it? And I said, absolutely. So there'll be a sixth grade show about a month and a half after the seventh and eighth grade show. And that's included in this budget, too, though? Uh, yeah. yeah. I was there on this past Saturday for TSA, and we had about 900 kids at TSA. And then I walked in, and we had about another 110 in the auditorium uh, for, for musical practice. And they were... and probably about 15, 20 parents working on sets. So we could not have done that in the uh, other CMS. We certainly could not. So it was a very busy day on Saturday. 
And then lastly is, again, the budget document for the PW High School Musical Year in Town on March 9th to the 11th, put on by Mickey Engel and Jennifer Crea. Again, this is their budget document. This is what they put together as far as uh, their revenues and their expenditures from a budgetary standpoint. We'll report on the actual um, after everything is solidified. But again, we wanted to get this in front of the committee for review, any questions, and again, an opportunity just to advertise for the PW you know, musical on March 9th to the 11th. Any questions on the PW High School Musical? All right, great. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is the uh, Central Monco Technical High School budget. Uh, this budget was adopted by the JOC uh, last week, February 1st. Um, you can see that uh, who the, the players are. Uh, they give you a little summary. Uh, they are looking at health insurance of 5.73 for both their medical and their um, prescription. Uh, there's the same, they pay the same retirement contribution that we do. Uh, they, they get into some of their equipment grants uh, that they're getting, uh, just as a summary. Then they present the, the revenue, and, uh, wow, it's hard to see, but uh, we're this number right here. Uh, looking at last year, uh, the three-member districts, which is Upper Marion, Norristown, and, and Colonial, uh, contributed uh, about seven point. $9 million, I think that is, $7.6 million. Uh, this year it's going up to $8.2 million. Uh, they also uh, incurred some debt to do some capital projects over there. Uh, that's a, an agreed upon uh, percentage uh, that's, that's based on uh, the, the agreement where uh, Upper Marion and Colonial pick up 35%, Norristown picks up 30%. Uh, the contributions are calculated on a three year. Uh, ADM, we did ADM so that we can uh, smooth the uh, cost uh, so that we don't have a huge impact to the budget uh, a year that we have a lot of kids that want to go to the VOTEC. Uh, so you can see that uh, based on the ADMs, uh, we are supposed to be picking up 24.75% of whatever the uh, VOTEC needs this year. Uh, Upper Marion picks up 18.53, and because Norristown sends most of the kids or majority of the kids they are picking up 56.73 percent uh, if we look at uh, the, the number of expenses uh, that, that is then uh, divvied up by those percentages and you can see that uh, they need 6.6 .6 million dollars to uh, balance the budget for operating they need uh, 1.56 which is the existing debt and then a smaller amount of 35 point or 34.582, so they're looking to collect from the member districts $8.245 million, of which 2.2 uh, would be for a colonial share. Uh, there is a slight adjustment from uh, last year that we have to pay 182 for a total that we're budgeting this year, 2.387 million, uh, but you can see what we were budgeted for last year, 1.383, so that's uh, a little bit over a million dollars extra in uh, uh, VOTEC uh, for the tuition that we have to pay this year. So that's the big impact I refer to in the 23-24 budget presentation. Uh, we still do have a few questions. I think we're scheduled to meet with the uh, uh, administration of VOTEC on uh, Valentine's Day. Um, so uh, we have asked some questions, because that's obviously a big dollar amount that we have to assume and our taxpayers have to assume this year. So we just want to make sure that uh, they're answering all our questions to our satisfaction, just in case you or our, our taxpayers might have a question about that. So any questions on the, the VOTEC budget? And if I mean this correctly, our ADM is going up in the sense that means we're sending more kids to the VOTEC school, like the program's getting the results we want? Well, I mean, looking at the, the ADMs, we're looking at 173 in 2021 and 207 in 21, 22. And now we're up to 224, so it's it's gradually climbing. They have great programs over there. Uh, the kids really enjoy it. Uh, we just want to make sure that the cost of the and the budget are you know that we understand them clearly. Great. Okay. If there's no other questions, we'll go to the. Montgomery County Intermediate Unit Budget. This is the mandated services budget. You, 
you get from the title, it's mandated that they offer us three, uh, they have three offices over there that provide every school district in the county. Uh, one is the uh, Community and Governmental Relations. We really appreciate that one because we get updates about what's going on in Harrisburg. Very important. Uh, we have the Organizational and Professional Learning. They deal a lot with uh, uh, Rosemary Gregitis as far as our, uh, you know, the, our professional learning and also the technology services, uh, which is district-wide, uh, and that's, we run our uh, internet through uh, the county. So uh, you can see that uh, a lot of explanations in there. Uh, they get into some of the numbers, but the ones that are most important are how much is it gonna cost us? We go all the way down to the bottom here, and you can see that uh, Last year, our contribution was 82963 and this year we're looking at uh, nine, uh, no, actually 90149 This year we're looking at 93466 So a $3,300 increase or 3.68 in our budget, that's nothing really to worry about. So we are <clears throat> asking that uh, the uh, both the uh, Musicals appear on the, the, the February agenda for approval. Uh, we'd like to ask uh, that the, the uh, MCIU mandated service budget appear on the agenda also. And depending on our meeting on the 14th, uh, if it goes smoothly, we'd like to see the VOTEC on there. If not, we'd like to table that until March until we get all our questions answered. Okay. Are there any, sorry. Any board, agenda, any board comments on any of the agenda items? Are there any public comments on anything covered in this meeting? Hello, everyone. That was a lot. <laughs> I'm tired. And uh, it's so small, or is it my eyes? Is that what it was? It was really it's small. small. Okay. <laughs> so it went over so much. I just want to make sure I'm in the proper meeting to talk about the, the items that I wanted to talk about. And I wanted to talk about the cafeteria, food, transportation, and the water that's in the school district. That's part of the transportation I saw up there, so that's correct, right? That was in a facility meeting prior to this. You, you can make prior, your comments, right. though. I can still make my comments. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm not uh, being no done it or in the right place. So I wanted to see if there's any budget for assistance we, on the bus. Can we have your name and... Oh, absolutely. My name is Tanikia Tanikia James, a.k.a. Focus James, and my daughter's in the Colonial Middle School. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And she just recently started catching a bus back. And it's a lot of activity. And I don't think it's fair to ask the drivers to drive the tweens as well as help manage them. Uh, we don't want to cause accidents by them trying to do both jobs. So I wanted to know if there's any budget to get assistance on there. Lots of testosterone and hormones flying all over the place for that one hour drive of actually being in school for six hours with like minimum movement, right? So I'm just concerned about the safety of the children and wondering if there's any budget to be able to hire assistants to come on uh, the, you know, the, the ride to support the driver, to keep the kids settled in. Uh, what do we have? It's a lot of cash up there. Anything that would be, that would be, that would be quite expensive to add an aid to every bus. But we mm -hmm. do, if we have a situation on the bus where we uh, need to help students make better choices, we mm -hmm. will either an administrator ride the bus or an aide. Uh, or teacher, and then we take care, we compensate them for doing that. Um, but ultimately, it's our job to work with our students and our and our parents and guardians to make sure students behave for that 35, 40 minute bus ride. I agree. I and agree. I was a middle school principal, so I do know yes. uh, the energy level uh, yes. that takes place in middle school. So yes. we do it when we have a need, um, yeah. but not it's not something we budget for for our 60 plus buses time. Understood, understood. So I actually called a few times the actual um, uh, first student and they said they had many complaints on a specific uh, route that my daughter's in. So who do I need to express the need for that particular bus? Cause you're right, I couldn't speak for all 60. Some of them might sure, be running pretty sure. smooth, but I know that bus needs it. Well, I'll call Mr. Kaplan after this meeting and let him know that he, sh uh, he can either reach out to you tomorrow or okay. if you want to reach out to him, but we can address that. Uh, okay. As soon as possible. Okay, that'd be perfect. Certainly. And, and my other concern was about the uh, the water and system. Some of the children are acting out, so they're literally kicking over, uh, you know, the water fountains. So I'm wondering, and that, yeah, to the brand new school that we spent, you know, some significant amount of money on. We're going up on taxes, so it's a little discouraging. And I know that's their way of acting out. Um, but I'm wondering what other 
support that we can give the school so that they're not tearing down something we just build up, right? That's a real concern. And, and that in and of itself is a concern. But then you have the rest of the students having to go down the hall or down the staircase to get fresh water because that system is down, right? So not only it has to get repaired, it costs more money, but now we're talking about the children getting to their classes late, right? This this shovel because they're trying to run from in the building is huge. It's beautiful. So thank sure. you for everything we did to build it. Um, but they only have like four minutes to go to the bathroom. So if the water fountain is broken or something uh, in that bathroom is broken because some kid decided, you know, to get their anger, frustration out. Now we're going to a whole nother floor. So now they get in those fabulous ODRs for not getting back. So you can hear the, the cycle of what's happening there. So I'm wondering, and I think it's happened about three times of what I heard with my ear to the ground with the children talking. That's not an official number. Don't quote me sure. on that, but it's happening too often. So what can we put in place for that so that we can help these children get their steam off without destroying the building? Well, we've got that huge gymnasium there, too, and phys ed class that hopefully uh, allows for, you know, to uh, get the steam off, as yeah. you put it. Uh, yeah. We also have to hold, and it's uh, when the situations like uh, that happen, it's very unfortunate. It's generally a very small group or, in, or one or two individuals that right. decide maybe they were angry yeah. uh, or having a tough day. Um, but we also hold, uh, hold children culpable for doing that. Yes. And so yeah. uh, we bring their families in. If there's a mm -hmm. cost associated with mm -hmm. replacing it, they'll be held accountable for that. Yeah. And Mr. Lally, who, who just left a few minutes ago, our facilities director, they do make sure that they get, uh, get things fixed and replaced right yes. away. And, yes. uh, um, and those hydration stations are great because the kids yes. can refill their bottles so exactly. we don't have a lot of plastic bottles around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll follow up with Mr. Lally and uh, Mr. Kaplan on that. Awesome. And I'm so glad you talked about Jim because I don't know if it, I know that's the meeting next week, but I know they only have it half of e a year. Right. So to have children sit down for six hours and not have a brain break, get their yeah, like, they have health the other half. Yeah, they're already, you know, high intense and, and there's been quite a bit of fights. So I think if we can roll that out full year, that might help, you know, bring the testosterone down for the guys I, and actually the gals. Actually, for our discipline, it's, it's really there. Mm -hmm. I know we had a situation about a week and a half ago, but our discipline really since November, there haven't been many fights at all. The building's been really running smoothly. Kids are doing well. We didn't yeah. have a lot in the fall, mm -hmm. but I, do, I am aware we had some that made right. social, social yeah. media. Uh, right. And that's why we had the guest speaker on social media. It seems yes, like, I was there. It seems really like one good. of the first things that happens, and, and, and as adults, I think we're guilty of it too. Okay. Whenever something like that happens, it's amazing to me that the first thing that comes out is the phone. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Like not to call for help. Yes. To record. To record. Yes. And, then, and then the story gathers momentum as it gets posted. And I've been in a middle school cafeteria when somebody forwards a video to someone else. Yeah. It's like the ripple effect doesn't it do it really, justice. No, not at um, all. So we're going to continue to bring in our speakers. I thought Mr. San Francisco was very well received. Yes. Um, I agree. And then he spoke to all the kids as yeah. well. Um, I but I have to say, I mean, in the, the building's fantastic. But the people within it are outstanding. So mm -hmm. we will address, without a doubt, we'll address your concerns because mm -hmm. uh, it's really been a, a, a great opening for the school. And, yeah. and I think 98, 99% uh, of our kids are making good choices. Yeah. And we just need to provide some guidance for those who are not. I, I agree. And I think part of that would really be beneficial to keep having Jim. My daughter finished her last gym uh, uh, class oh, last week and yeah. she was so sad. I was like, what's the matter? She said, I'm not going to have Jim for a whole year. I said, a whole year? She said, yeah, because the next six months I don't have Jim. And my first six months of eighth grade, I won't have Jim. That's a long time to ask children to sit down for six hours learning six or seven subjects and still stay calm. We can't do it. You know, our doctors tell, <laughs> tell us to get up every hour and hour, stretch, get a drink, right? So to ask children to do that, I think we're not setting them up for the best success. So that, I want to, you know, advocate for that. But I I'll be here next that. Monday for that meeting, for the curriculum. Okay. I'll let Mrs. <laughs> but, um, and last but not least is the food. If we stand in the cafeteria, we see they waste so much. And I think it's about texture, taste. And I know they've been working hard. I actually spoke to Ms. McClennan and she been, they've been working hard as far as that menu. You. So I just would like to see our dollars really honored and the food get in the kids and not in the trash because it's not tasting well. Um, but she's definitely been, you know, working on that. But I do want to just say that out loud to the, you know, to the powers that be that maybe you guys can help her, you know, with that so the children are not wasting as much. But also that it's more nutritious and maybe some less of the sugary snacks because oh, like I can have Mrs. McCoy come out. She does a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. We hired a nutritionist nice. this past year. 
and we meet, we exceed all the standards and mm -hmm. like we don't have, we have baked goods instead. Uh, yeah. if, if the kids want chips and those types of things, they yeah. have to be baked. And there's, I don't know the exact percentage, but there's sure. a percentage that you have to have of healthy versus the other types of snacks. Yeah. I do know the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple of former middle school schoolers in my house. Mm -hmm. I know they gravitate towards yeah. sometimes the sweeter thing. Exactly. But we can have Laurie come back to a yeah. community relations meeting. Yeah. Lori does a great job with that, yeah. and uh, uh, and our our head cooks are doing a, a really <laughs> wonderful job. Yeah. And they're offering more choices at the middle school than they ever yes. did. Yes. Um, kids can pre-order things at mm -hmm. the high school. So, yeah. but I can have Lori come back. Uh, we haven't done it for about a year and a half. She. Yeah. Uh, and she can also give you a call and answer any questions. Okay, I would love that. Um, and and you're, not, you're so right. More, there's more carrots. There's more fresh fruit. Yep. Yeah, and I'm a, totally and impressed by that. Mm -hmm. There's required components for every mm -hmm. school lunch. And so mm -hmm. uh, we even are doing tastings at the elementary level. So mm -hmm. kids don't learn, turn into somebody like me who doesn't like Brussels sprouts yeah. or broccoli. Uh, and we encourage them. We even have a mascot that dresses up and goes around cool. and does tastings. So yeah. uh, we'll continue that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and if and Laurie's great. We can call her and say, hey, we want to try this at the middle school. She'll mm -hmm. find a way to do it. Yes, so. yes. They definitely have. My daughter's been part of that test tasting as well. Oh, nice. And being able to give a survey and opinion. So, well, that's it for me. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I Thank appreciate you for your it. comments. All right. Bye-bye. Dr. Christian, I did have one question about the gym question. Yeah. Um, they brought activity period back recently. and. Do they have physical activity activity options, or are the gyms used for sports? Or uh, I know that's the last period of the day. Yeah. I'd have to double check, um, but I believe there's an option to sign up for that. But I'll find out. I know it started back up after the winter break. Yep. The biggest request we get from uh, sixth graders, and it's been for the past my experience, the past. 20 some years in education is bring back recess to middle school yeah. and uh that's the biggest that you could do all the transition prep you want from fifth to sixth grade and that's still the number one question uh that we get from the fifth graders as we prepare them to go to the middle school is there any additional public comment all right seeing none we'll adjourn this meeting of the finance committee Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to the uh, Facilities Committee meeting and uh, FMT. Um, are there any public comments? No public comment. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Joe Lally. Thank you, Will. Good evening, everyone. The first item we have on the agenda this evening is the five-year capital plan. And if I could get you to please, Mr. Zablowski, focus on the 23-24 priority page. And, and this is up on board docs for everybody to review. So what, what we would like to do this evening is just review the projects that we would like to do over the 23-24 school year. Um, so you're going to see the projects listed there on the screen. I know they might be a little bit difficult to see. Um, one of them is the HVAC at Conshohocken, and that is for the, uh, the, if you remember, we started last year, the roof replacement, and then this year we said we would take, we would replace the air conditioning on the roof there. So again, them project, there's no different projects on there um, that, that nobody on the board would not, that you're not aware of that was not on the document previously. So when you're looking at that 23-24 school year, that's just projects that we're prioritizing for that year. So the one that really sticks out that's in there and that you're going to see is the one which I think if Mr. Zablowski scrolls down, thank you, sir, is the uh, enrollment classroom uh, addition here at Colonial Elementary School. 
Um, just so everyone knows, that number that we got there is based on new construction per square foot. It's not based on a renovated construction, so depending on what we would decide to do, if we went with a renovation, it could be less expensive. So we put the, the higher number in there, and that's in the event that we went with an addition versus a renovation. Uh, so I, know, I believe everyone's aware that we're, we're in the middle of doing another enrollment study, but this is based off of the 512 um, kindergartners we have currently. So I think, um, Dr. Christian, you're going to... I don't know if you were chiming in. I was going to go, yeah, so it's based off of those 512 kindergarten students we have now. And then we'll look at that enrollment study, obviously, when we get it back a little closer and see, you know, what we actually need to do um, to make sure that we can, we can handle the students. Mr. Lally, um, you're talking about the possibility of an addition here with that number. Correct. In which direction are we allowed to go? Well, this is this is a good point if you remember right because um, we, can't we have go that way. We, right the covenant we can't go that way if we if you remember we had talked about possibly going out off the corner because we could um, and then taking the, the bus loop kind of up and around um, we're, we're reviewing a couple different ideas um, dr. Christian and Dave and I have spoken and, and recently got mark involved just to hear the ideas that were that we we had done in the past when we did the feasibility study with uh, um, GKO architects I'm going to say about four or five years ago so we kind of resurrected that can you can you please for anybody on the board or listening who doesn't know what the covenant is so the agreement that's in the back of the building, basically what it, what it is, is it's an, we're not allowed to build out or go further. I mean, to, to, to surmise what we're allowed to, we're not allowed to, that, that, that area. Oh, that field like, in the back behind right, the playground. It as a play area. That's it. Right. We can't even have competitions on there. We right. couldn't convert it to a football field or soccer field or baseball And that field was area. an agreement with White Marsh Township when Correct. they well, gave us that land in return for a piece of land. Correct. So behind back, Victory Fields, right? Yep. Behind okay. Victory Fields, if you look back at the furthest, I guess behind two and four, the fields in the back, that property was actually owned by the district. But Joshua Knoll Detention Basin backed up to that. It kind of made sense logically that we did a land swap because they owned this and we didn't. So then with the land swap, there was, um, you know, just some restrictions on what we could do. All right. And second question, are you in the process of getting some ideas um, for anybody who doesn't know, there's space on the third floor that no one can get to. Um, have you, do you have someone working on ideas of how to utilize that empty space? We do. And, and again, Dr. Christian and I have talked about that. We've looked at utilizing a couple different areas in the school that would be beneficial, that would actually accommodate the number of, a st number of students comfortably and, and maybe even with a little bit of extra room. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And if anybody on the board would love to take a tour, I'm sure Dr. Christian and Mr. Lally would love to take you uh, for a tour of that space on the third floor. It's kind of unbelievable if you don't actually see it firsthand. So maybe set up something, Joe. Sure, for absolutely. For people to see. Then when you talk about it, sure, it will they'll set. have a visualization of what, it, what, it, absolutely. what the so, space is. So the board has, uh, thank Joe, very thorough, appreciate it. Uh, a little more context, we have 512 first graders backed up by 400 and nearly 50, 450 kindergartners. So currently in this building, we have just about 800 students in the two grades. So obviously by 25, 26, uh, those classes, if, even if they just maintain their size, you're looking at another 100 plus kids in this building. We know the middle school can handle it. Um, we. We believe, but we'll defer to the architects, that we don't need an addition here. We just need to do a better, uh, be more efficient in using our space. And so we'll present, uh, and we asked um, GKO, since they have history here, and they had all the, uh, when I came to the district, they had already begun working on some scenarios for the board for long-term planning. We thought it best to go back to them and dig those plans back out, which they had. Uh, they also were doing some other work for us, so it worked out very well. But it will, we'll look at that space. We'll look at converting this space, uh, these offices here, because they're right across from the library and near the cafeteria. Uh, we can also, there's some other spaces we can take a look, maybe move some offices that are upstairs closer to the front of the building. But we have time. We just want it on your radar 
um, because we're going to blink and those first graders are going to be in third grade and then we're going to need a bigger boat. So uh, um, we just, you know, we're probably looking at, you know, starting the work next year, near the end of next year, but we just want the board to be aware. And for those of you that don't know, GKO is the architect who did the high school renovations and the renovations here. Did they, they were the architects for the renovations here? They were the architect for partial renovations yeah. here. But the but whole they, high school. They did the high school, Plymouth Elementary, White Marsh, and um, Bridges. They did Plymouth Everything and Everything but the middle school. Edition. Yeah. We, we believe we're going to need six. We're, we're asking GKO to look for eight classrooms. We think we'll need six to six to eight because um, you just can't ask, add classrooms. You probably have to add a room for special education instruction. You probably have to add a room for a specialist, uh, whether it be art or music somewhere. You know, just because that's the, that's the elementary schedule. I had two questions. Um, as far as like ideas, are they are you guys feeling ideas like would it be possible to add uh, a floor above these two spaces? No, no. Didn't want to and, do that. Right? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Christian asked the same thing. So it actually because it starts obviously thinking about with with the foundation and how the foundation was built. So we could only put so much actual physical weight on the top there. Okay. So I mean, I know that at one point in time there was conversation for this area and the library to be to be blocked in and then this center court to become rooms again so to bring it down so you would have another floor above us um it's a really rich structurally it's very difficult with columns and things that you have to put up so your space management here would not be as great as you think it is right. once you were able to hold stand it so okay we looked at that option met probably 2007 2008 the other question I had was uh, when you mentioned the covenant or whatever with this, covenant. is that forever or is that like you That's, can revisit it at 30 years or nope. something? Yeah, I mean, I don't like to ever say forever, but okay. um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty etched in stone because again, there's a lot, lot to do with the, the neighbors along the side and what they want to actually have in there. So when the township made the agreement to do the swap, we kind of locked in and we did benefit from it largely. We didn't use that space in the back at all. So, you know, we are able to do some after school practices and things and, you know, we're able to use it for our, for our students and benefit for sure. It's forever. For all intents and purposes. So again, that's, that's just the, again, the, the big number um, in, in the 23-24 school year. We, we did talk about, if on, the, on a, little, a little higher up, is the $1.7 million number in the same year for air conditioning of the, the gym and the auditorium here. Um, Dr. Christian, Dave, and Mark and I had a conversation about possibly just the auditorium, um, because again, it is used for a lot of events here. Um, we have a lot more events coming this way from our elementary schools, and maybe that's a good idea to lump in with, you know, any kind of addition project at the same time. So again, we're just identifying that, and it obviously would be a board, you know, a board choice at that point. Joe, what's an R22, R2U? So the uh, Conchahawken R22, RTU stands for rooftop units and automated temperature controls is ATC. The R22 is the refrigerant that is going, that the EPA has basically said you have till 2024 and then they're not gonna produce it anymore. They're actually producing it still right now, but it, a, a 30 pound container um, five, six years ago was about $80 and a 30 pound container now is almost $2,000. One way to get rid of it. Yes. Okay. So again, I know all this is on board doc, so if everyone wants to review it, and again, you can feel free to send me an email, copy Dr. Christian, Dave, and, and I'll be glad to try and answer any questions anyone may have. Um, and again, if I can, just Dave, you can go to the 23, uh, 22, the current year we're in. So again, we, I think everyone's aware we replaced the upper roof at Conchahawken over the summer. Um, we're doing some work at, at the other schools with a lot of preventative roof maintenance. And, and, and in past, you'll see there is some 
roofing replacement in the five-year improvement for other schools. Um, we have identified that at a previous meeting, but we, we can obviously bring that up and discuss that in more detail at another time. But the, the roofing projects are identified because most of our roofs are past that 20-year period. I know, hard to believe. <laughs> that means we've been here too long, Joe. I know. So it's a, it's a, they're past that period. So it's, again, they're, we're identifying, and if we can, obviously, you know, um, with this being a live breathing, breathing document, you know, move things around as we see needed. If you know a roof can make it another year, and we have another project that we feel like, you know, is a, a bigger priority, then that's that's kind of how we manipulate the list with your approval. Um, one more question: that the install new gym roof drain at PE. Are you doing that yourselves? Is that why that, what's the yellow block about? No, we just, um, we, we actually, there's some things we're waiting for budgeted cost on to get it done. So yeah, so yeah, I apologize for that. I should have probably been waiting on budget cost there, but, um, but yeah, that's just uh, an additional drain. We, we see when the, when we get heavy rains, it got an area that's collecting a lot of water. That's just going to compromise the other parts of the roof. So putting another drain in would make more sense. So again, that's, that's the list that was there. Um, so what we're actually looking for is just an, an approval for the 23-24 school year. Um, at this time, is, is you know, so you, everyone kind of gets an idea of where we're going. Um, and one last point, if I can, the emergency generators that we talked about, um, they're one year out. So I would also like the approval to get, put them out for bid, work for getting them out to bid now. I identified them, or I say we, I apologize, identified them in, I believe, the 24, 25 year to be replaced, because if we can put it out, get a bid packet together, put them out, say, by April, May of this year, then actually get a unit ordered, we would have them for the following April, May, and then that summer they could be installed. So that would be the plan for them, because generators are unfortunately a year out. We identified those as a priority. Obviously, the roof work is a priority uh, in addition to the HVAC rooftop units. Um, and then uh, just for the board's edification, inboard docks, which is uh, available for all to see. We did get an inquiry this morning. Jessica Lester got it from a family who's new to the community. They don't have any kids in school yet, but they saw in our five-year plan in 27, 28, the potential for a new elementary school. We are explaining that that is a possibility, but not a reality at this time. It could be additions to existing schools. That's why we're doing the enrollment study. So we have to be prepared. We have to know that what the potential cost is and have it out there. Um, but there's just so, since I'm being recorded, there's no new elementary school planned right now, no redistricting planned right now. Um, when we get to 25, 26, somewhere around there, we'll revisit it. But first, we need the enrollment study. But we really felt, Joe felt very strongly, and we all agree, Dave and I agree, and Mark, that um, the generators are a high priority. The roof work is a high priority. So, uh, you know, our, our facilities are in great shape. Um, and uh, I think they did a really nice job spreading it around to all the schools, making sure they're all treated equitably and that we have a good plan in place. And, and Napier Own obviously helped as well. We also, oh, one other thing, I'm sorry. I did ask Joe, uh, we've applied for several grants, as the board's aware, over the past few years related to security and safety. Uh, we were able to purchase additional cameras. Mr. McDonald helped with that. I said anything in here related to communication or improving communication among our buildings or within our buildings, if it needs to be prioritized, that he'll come back to the board, um, especially if it's like a matching grant that we apply for where the district has to uh, maintain you know, 50% of it, if it improves, you know, if it's a good idea and improves our safety and security, specifically as it relates to communication, you know, we'll find a way to do it. I think we have strong systems in place, but technology is ever changing. Thank you, Dr. Christian. Um, if there's no more questions, again, I know it's a large document. You can kind of look at it on board docs and then let me know if you have any other questions. Like I said, send them to myself and Dave or Dr. Christian, and we'll be glad to answer them. Um, and again, we'll work on, if anyone wants to see the, uh, the upper floor that, that Sue's talking about, we'll be glad to take you up there. Um, it's interesting to say the least. I, I think for the record, I think most people do know that this was a middle school at one point in time. No, it wasn't. It was a junior high. Yeah, well, junior high, middle school. Junior high. I'm sorry, I apologize. And junior this high. was an outdoor atrium. Okay. 
That's concrete right. slab. I remember it. <laughs> so um, if there's no more questions on the five-year capital, I would like to move to the second item on the agenda. And this, this is just a, um, we spoke about our, our, our facilities fees. Um, I want to say several meetings back. And, and so what we'd like to propose is an adjustment to the actual policy for facilities and, and not with classification or regards to anything except the actual last page. So if you can scroll to page five, please. So the way the current document reads, it stops at the board of directors will review the rate, the rental rates annually and it stops right there. So that's where, that's where it stops. So in, in talking again with Dr. Christian and Dave and Mark, we looked at, we were looking for board approval to amend that policy to say, with the possibility of the annual raising fees and labor as measured by Act 1 index set by PDE. Additionally, every three years, the Board of School Directors will review a comparison of rental fees from other local area school districts and may adjust the rental fees as deemed necessary. So I've started that process. So um, we thought that putting in just the index would give us some ability to come back to you every year to say, do you want to raise them per index? Uh, and then again, making the, the actual comparison every three years. It is very difficult, I will tell you, to make comparisons. And I'll give you one quick small example. Some people rent their auditorium by the hour. Some people rent it by the four hours. Some people rent it only all day. Some people rent it with the custodian in their cost. So, so it's, it's very hard to draw the same comparison to figure out where, where Colonial fits with like neighboring schools. So I'll gather as much, and I'll work with the facilities team, um, Lynn McCarthy, and, and um, they work great with trying to find out, you know, just acting like residents, they wanna, they wanna rent facilities and find out what the cost is. But the feedback is, is all over the place. So we have a spreadsheet that, that we, we made up, but it's, it's very difficult to read, because um, it's, it's, it's all over. But what we're actually recommending is just to amend that policy. And I guess we'd have to have a first read um, on the policy. So that would be just this evening at the first read to take a look at that. Joe, when was the last time that the matrix the fee thing was updated? 2018, I think we have it, probably late 17, early 18. So, question for you. Sure. Since it says we'll review the rates annually, are we locking ourselves into more work if we add this policy on by saying we have to do the comparison every three years? Um, I mean, I don't know that we're locking ourselves into more work. I, I just think it's probably just the prudent thing for us to do to just keep an eye on what, you know, what other people are doing, especially neighboring schools. And I don't think it's more work, though. Okay, just because as, as I'm reading it, it's if we're reviewing the rental rates annually, we can change the rental rates annually so we don't have to. If we, didn't, if we didn't add this policy, we could still proceed without it. Right. Okay. Make sure I read that. Yeah. There's no more questions on the uh, rental fee policy. That is the last item on the agenda this evening. I believe, I'm sorry, Mr. Wazablowski, I believe you have a transportation update. Yes, we do. Uh, Last week, we met a new uh, depot manager that first student has just hired. Um, so he's a retired uh, Phil uh, Philadelphia policeman. Uh, seems like a very nice guy. So we're looking forward to working with him. Uh, this weekly update that we got, uh, we, are, we have one driver that's ready to take the test, and we have another driver that passed the test. So right now, we have two subs. Unfortunately, it's flu season. So we don't have enough subs, so uh, we're hoping to, to gather more. Uh, we did notify uh, first student of White Marsh Days coming up, and we told them that they have a booth reserved for them so we can hopefully get the, the word out there. Uh, one item on the negotiations with the contract with first student, uh, we received a proposal on Friday. We have a uh, meeting set up with uh, Greg Gallagher from first student on Wednesday. Uh, I would defer to an executive session to, to give you those details because we're in contract negotiation. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions from the board? No? No? Any questions from uh, the public? Public comment? 
I think. If you don't mind, you can just come to the podium. If you could give us your name and your... Yes. Thanks. My name is Jasmine Williams. Um, I have an 11-year-old that goes here, Kyleen Williams. And I have a 6-year-old that goes to Plymouth Elementary. Um, I'll get into that, but while I was here and you were talking about HVAC renovation, so on and so forth, uh, totally not why I came but I do work for CELA. I just got the okay from my general manager. Whenever you guys do decide, if you decide to do any kind of roofing, we do um, HVAC, electrical, and plumbing work. That's a guaranteed 10 to 15% off. They will come, assess everything, and move forward with you guys. Um, but that's not why I came. I just wanted to offer that. <laughs> we, we do appreciate the reference. No problem. Thank you. Yep, CELA is located in King of Prussia as well. Um, the reason that I am here, I wanted to actually pull something up, and again, forgive me if this is not the right board meeting. My mother-in-law is Kim Williams. She runs BCA, um, and she pushed me to come here tonight. Am I getting emotional? I wanted to start off to say, never be a prisoner of your past. It was just a lesson, not a life sentence. Now, the reason that I am here is because I am very hands-on with my kids. Um, when parent-teacher night comes, I do not do Zoom. I won't take a phone call. I'm coming face-to-face. -face. If there's any issues, concerns, or anything I am able to do in school or outside of school, I do it. I'm very hands-on with my kids. It bothers me that I have been rejected from going to their um, school trips due to a situation that occurred 11 years ago before they were even born or even thought of. That led to a felony. High school sweetheart, thinking you're in love. Wrong place, wrong time. My name was on a lease. He was doing things. I, were, I went to Westchester University. I worked a full-time job. I walked into a situation that I had no idea about. The end result, Montgomery County, I had to take a felony because I did not, I was not able to afford $20,000 for a lawyer to fight this. So I have been dealing with this for 11 years. So, in effect, I passed the child clearance. I have no issues. But the fact that this situation from 2012, when we are in 2023, is still taking me as if I am a prisoner. I do not think that it's right. And my mother-in-law told me. Sorry. Take my mother-in-law said, I need to come here, show my face, so everybody knows I'm serious about this. I've spoken to the guy that denied me. I was going back and forth very nice. I'm just like, I don't understand how am I still being judged off of something? My kids weren't even here. And now they are being penalized for something that occurred. Everyone makes mistakes in life. Okay? You're not the same person that you were last year. Not even yesterday. If you want to wake up and say, I'm going to make a change, I will make a change. And I do not feel like it is right that my six-year-old came home from Lego land trip, crying, saying, Mommy, I just want you to come to my trips. It's not fair that everybody else's mom is there and not you. I can't look at them in their face and say, Well, Mommy made a mistake when she was younger, and now you're being penalized for it. I don't think that it's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry again if this was not the right board meeting. But I had to come here so you guys know. I don't think I should still be judged of, of of something that happened 11 years ago. And I didn't have the finances to pay for a good lawyer to fight for that. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening and sharing with us.
Other comments? No other comments. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. Um, with that, we will adjourn this meeting and move into the HR, HR meeting. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes break. Okay, moving into HR, are there any public comments about HR? Okay. Michelle? Thank you, Mrs. Moore. On tonight's agenda, there is just one board policy for review. Um, the intent is to have a first reading take place on February 23rd at the public board meeting and a second reading and possible adoption at the Mar March public board meeting. This is a new policy uh, stated as policy 304, employment of district staff. You'll notice there are bolded um, content in this particular policy, which outlines the responsibility of the superintendent and designee um, for requiring necessary credentialing criteria, criteria application process for candidates, as well as the requirement for recommendation for board approvals of pre-employment, pre-employment, excuse me, backgrounds, Delegation of responsibility, again, to the superintendent and or designee, and what the um, requirements are of instructional aids as well in each of the categories of professional, administrative, and support staff personnel. This policy will remain on the board's uh, board doc website and any requested changes and or recommendations can be made to my office um, and they will be taken under consideration and if compliance with compliant with the law will be presented to the board um, at the february meeting any questions about the, the policy That is the only item that I have on tonight's HR committee meeting agenda. Are there any public comments? Okay, seeing none, meeting adjourned. Very efficient, Michelle.